Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 5b, where we're going to take, for once, a somewhat historical view of a problem. The problem being how to reconcile the discontinuous nature of genetic variation with the continuous nature of natural phenotypic variation. So, before about 1850, um, biologists looked at organisms in their natural environment, and they observed continuous variation within each species. But there was substantial variation. And the biologists basically assumed that parental characters were blended in the offspring, that the offspring would always be intermediate between the two parents. But they didn't really test this. They also observed that different species were very well adapted to their different environments and different lives. And they struggled to find explanations for this. Darwin came along and explained um, adaptation of different species as a consequence of natural selection acting on continuous variation in small populations. That natural selection would always slightly favor minor differences in these continuously varying traits, gradually shifting the population to better and better adaptation. But there was a problem underlying Darwin's theory of natural selection, and that was that he, like his contemporaries, assumed that inheritance occurred by blending. This is a big problem for evolution by natural selection because blending inheritance eliminates phenotypic variation. Gradually, all the offspring are going to look like the average instead of like extremes of variation. And natural selection will have no variation to act on. At the same time, the problem posed by blending inheritance was being solved, although no one realized it at the time. And it was being solved by Mendel, the first real geneticist. We'll talk about Mendel quite a lot more in Module 8. But one extremely important finding that Mendel made was that the factors that control heredity do not blend. That discrete factors, what we now call alleles, are passed unaltered from parent to offspring through the generations. So you may inherit an allele that causes you to have, for instance, your grandfather's nose, even though neither of your parents displayed this trait. However, Mendel's studies had the problem of not being recognized by other scientists. Even though Darwin, for example, had a copy of Mendel's paper, he didn't read it. Darwin's ideas were eventually rejected by later, later naturalists, later biologists, and they rejected his ideas because they didn't account for, they couldn't be explained by the current model of um, inheritance, that it blended. And instead, the later naturalists um, came up with other ideas. They said maybe acquired characters are inherited. This is the kind of thinking that was popularized by Lamarck. Um, or maybe organisms have some sort of innate drive for change. This kind of idea is still sometimes being suggested by crackpots. Um, or maybe new variants appeared suddenly by some mysterious unknown mechanism. At the same time, Dar Mendel's theory was running into problems too. It was basically too weird, too much ahead of its time to be accepted. And it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that his ideas were rediscovered and gave rise to the very successful genetic field um, of genetic analysis, the study of how the genes that Mendel had discovered actually worked. This gave rise to a particular um, genetic studies using the fruit fly and other model organisms, and the genetics that um, focused on distinct phenotypes, the discrete 
discontinuously varying characters that we discussed in the last two modules. So the Mendelian geneticists could explain inheritance, but they're explaining inheritance of discrete characters, not of continuous variation. The consequence was that there were now two schools of biologists. There was the what were called the biometricians because they measured. Um, they studied continuous variation in natural populations and they said, oh, this genes that these fruit fly people work on are just weird laboratory phenomena. They have nothing to do with natural variation or with evolution. On the other hand, the geneticists scoffed at the biometricians because they were invoking all these mysterious, unscientific forces, whereas the geneticists had a clear explanation and understanding of the mechanism of heredity. The resolution to this came in an accord that was termed the modern evolutionary synthesis. This led to the conclusion that Darwin was right and Mendel was right. Genes are indeed responsible for inheritance, and they're in responsible for small, continuous phenotypic differences, as well as the discrete ones that we've talked about so far. Natural selection acts, as Darwin had said, by changing the frequencies of alleles in pop. Darwin didn't talk about alleles, but natural selection acts by changing the genetic factors that cause these small differences in phenotype. So we're still left, now that we understand the nature of the genetic variation, that DNA variation is unambiguously discontinuous. How does this discontinuous DNA variation cause the smooth phenotypic variation we see in natural populations? And the explanations are going to be discussed in the upcoming lectures. First, that most DNA variants that aren't silent, that change phenotype at all, cause only very small changes to a phenotype. In addition, most of these affect many aspects of different phenotypes. They also depend very much on what variants are present at many other positions. This is a, an example of the kind of interaction effects that we began to discuss in Module 4. The environment also affects phenotype, and chance events play important roles in phenotype as well. All of these are going to be discussed in the upcoming lectures in Module 5. So we've discussed how biologists struggle to reconcile natural phenotypic variation with laboratory genetics. On the one hand, they had very solid observations of populations. On the other hand, the laboratory genetics was beautiful science. And the solution, many factors are contributing, and their interactions blur the discrete differences so that we get smoothly varying phenotypes from discrete DNA sequence differences. Coming up next, before we can think about how genetic differences cause phenotypic differences, we have to address the question of heritability. How much of the phenotypic differences that we see is actually due to DNA sequences? Because some of it is going to be due to environmental effects and chance. The contributions of these factors are very different for different phenotypes, and we'll talk about how we think about that in the next lecture. I hope to see you there.